worse than them all. I hope you die. <gasps> I hope your head gets stuck in the fryer and you end up boiling in your skin. <laughs> I want all of you dead. I hope this place burns to the ground. <clears throat> Can I pick up my last check on Friday? I think we found a spot for you. Who was that? I don't know, someone who used to work here a couple of minutes ago. My name is Steve. I'm also known as the Fry Master. Now, what did you say your name was again? Ashley. Well, from now on, Ashley, you're going to be known as Fry. Is that all right? My name's Ashley. One thing you gotta understand, Brad, is that this is my domain. I'm king here, and what I say becomes law. And I say that your name is Brad. <laughs> now, Brad, this is your area. Your area is small because you have no importance. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm like far too attractive to be like working at a fast food restaurant. Like sometimes it's hard to be around me because like. I'm just so much more attractive than everyone else. Yeah, no, I was just wondering if I try to warn people, but it comes up anyway. I've been informed by my informant in the government that we're gonna have a surprise inspection by the health inspectors today. Wait, that means we're gonna have to switch out all the meat then. Right, well that's obviously step one. Is the meat not good? I had one of the burgers for lunch. Shouldn't I have eaten the burger? When you hear them say, like, step into the light, step away from it, okay? We do not have time to deal with the untimely death of the new girl. Actually, you have the rats. So, Mantha, you flush the toddlers out of the tube slides. Take the new girl with you. I thought I was supposed to hide the rats. I can't be expected to remember everything I say. All right, let's like go. Aren't we ready for the health inspectors? Stick with me, kid, and like don't trust anyone. You know, $19 an hour isn't enough for this. Just go get me the can of Crisco. The kids need to slide right out. There's like four kids stuck in there. They're here, they're here. Act like you know what you're doing. Mop something. No, Stabby. Friend? Yes, like, I am your friend. But like, you need to go back in the hole. Oh, scary. Stabby, sad. I know, but like, you need to go back in the hole. Stabby, go in the hole. This looks like a fine eating establishment. Excuse me. Welcome to the Brigatorium, where we follow all federal health guidelines. If you notice my hands, they're clean. And they are also lightly scented. Can I have a deluxe burger, please? Of course. Would you like, like anything to drink with that? I'll have an iced tea. We don't have iced tea. It says right there you do. What kind of place are you running here? Like a place in full compliance with like federal health guidelines? How about a diet Pepsi? Fine, I'll have one. But enough of this charade. I must now appear before you as I truly am. My name is Inspector Jenkins from the Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm here to inspect this restaurant. You can all come out now. Now, I'm going to take a quick tour of this facility, and for every violation I discover, you will receive. One demerit. Now, where is your manager? Do you have a manager? I am the manager. Like, in the instance that the manager cannot fulfill his or her duties, the, like, counter pull with the most experience, like, steps in. It's in our laws. Then, manager. One demerit. Let's take a look in the kitchen. Oh, what is that on the floor? Is that a fry? Right on the floor, tins of merits. Mmm. Manager, dead in freezer. One of the merits. Ah! What? I thought we were all fainting now. This man was killed within the last hour, and all of you are suspects. Well, I didn't do it. What we are looking for is someone who 
not only had the motive, but the opportunity to kill Manager Torok. How do you know he was murdered? Maybe he had like a heart attack or something. Maybe he ate some of the food. I mean, the food here is really good. I examined the plotting list and I discovered several things. One, that this was not an accident. Two, that he was dead. Three, that he was murdered. Four, that one of you did it. But I already know who the murderer is, but I plan on keeping you in suspense for a little while, because by the time I'm done, the murderer will confess, and we will have to go through the bloody business of a trial. First, you, the counter babe. Thank you, but like, I'm like really attractive, and like, we all know that like, killers are ugly people. Isn't it true though, that you're a vegetarian, and along with being a vegetarian, you don't eat meat? Isn't that some kind of commie thing? Yeah, like, real Americans don't even know how to spell vegetarian. Fine, I'm a vegetarian, but like, what's so wrong with that? I'm afraid this commie is only guilty of bad taste, not murder, because the real murder is Steve. Or should I call you by your real name, Steven? I've been on to you since the moment I walked through this door. You really want to challenge the fine master? You wanted to be manager so bad. You wanted to be manager so bad you killed for it. There's like one thing you didn't count on though, and that's my offense attorney. Fine, you're innocent. Now as long as there's no more random surprises, I believe the murderer is Hey kids, it's me, Squirmy, the musical tapeworm. See, I saw this ad in the newspaper, and it said you needed a new mascot. And what could be better than a cute mascot who could love each and every tot? You knew Torok. Well, I did, but then I murdered him because he wouldn't let me be the new mascot. All right, Worm, you're under arrest for the murder of manager Torok. Just like one moment, she like happens to be an invertebrate worm. Our law is like occupied to humans. Therefore, you can't charge a gigantic worm with murder. Does that mean I'm immune from the law and I can kill anyone I want? You like, sure can. There's a place for me, a time and place for me, and your intestines and two kidneys. Deep in there somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Wow, I'm hungry. Who wants to eat? <laughs> Soil aggregates and pores, decreasing the amount of erosion because the soil is still healthy. 
together, and there are plenty of pores to let the water enter the soil. Soil cover also keeps the soil cool, shades the soil from evaporation, and increases water infiltration. As stated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, the soil surface temperature of covered soil is around 40 degrees cooler than that of bare soil. As a result, water infiltration is also increased because there isn't as much evaporation. Plants also increase water infiltration because their roots create pores for the water to enter the soil through, causing it to be able to run deeper into the soil. In the book, The Drought Resilient Farm, published in 2018, Gail Strickler tells us that in some cover crop locations, the amount of water infiltration is increased by almost sixfold. Lastly, soil cover holds nutrients for the soil. Nutrients are supposed to be recycled, and plants help with it. They pull nutrients from the soil to help them grow and store those nutrients in them. When the plants decompose, those nutrients then go back into the soil. Continually burying or baling the crop residue causes the soil to lose those nutrients. It's like if you were to compost your leftovers and then throw them in the landfill. If farmers can keep soil cover on their crop, their crop turnout will increase and their crops will be naturally infused with more nutrients. Now let's talk about the benefits of crop diversity. According to the Crop Trust mission, there are around 20,000 edible plants around the world, but only 200 of those plants are actually used as food. With nine of those plants covering a total of two-thirds of our food production, that is not enough diversity to satisfy our soil. And what about those other 19,800 plants that we could be using? There are many benefits to crop diversity. Crop diversity prevents fungus and diseases by increasing competition among pests. For example, if you always grow corn on the same field, you create a habitat for organisms that thrive on corn and could potentially disease your corn. Crop diversity also feeds microbiology. Living roots feed microbiology, and microbiology is important to the soil. If the same crop is always being grown in the area, the diversity of microbiology will be lower since all organisms don't thrive on the same thing. Additionally, animals can help with our crop diversity because they cycle nutrients back into the soil faster. The Drought Resilient Farm says that the animals eat the plants and then spread the nutrients from the plants into the soil through their manure. Dung beetles, earthworms, and other insects <coughs> then break apart and spread the manure to help cycle those nutrients even faster. Crops also create pores. Pores are spaces that water and oxygen can move through in the soil. If there are pores, that means that more water and oxygen can then get into the soil. These can then be stored in the soil as they move deeper in with the help of the pores. The plants can then easily get to store water when necessary, as long as they are able to have long roots. Farmers should diversify the crops that they grow. This could provide their land and crops many benefits that will contribute to soil health and the nutritional value of their products. Finally, let's dig through the negative effects of tilling. I bet you all thought tilling was good. Well, I'm about to prove you wrong here. There are a number of negative side effects of tilling. Tillage destroys pores and compacts the soil. Pores help the two necessities of oxygen and water move deeper into the soil while also decreasing the risk of erosion. When the soil is tilled, soil aggregates and pores are broken, resulting in erosion, water runoff, and oxygen deficiencies. The water and oxygen also struggle to get into the soil, which, in turn, deprives the plants of necessary resources. Most types of tillage also form a platy layer of soil at the bottom of the tillage layer, called a cloud pan. This layer is packed so tightly that oxygen, water, and roots cannot break through the layer. Tillage also disturbs biology and organisms along with organic matter. Tillage tears apart the roots living in the soil that has many purposes. One of those purposes is to feed biology and organisms living in the soil. When these roots are taken away, these important organisms that are there because of crop diversity don't have food to do what they need to. As stated by Iowa State University in the article, Frequent Tillage and Its Impact on Soil Quality, some microbial communities are even completely destroyed by tillage. Tillage also breaks down soil aggregates which have organic matter in them. This organic matter holds nutrients and water for the soil. According to the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition, organic matter can hold enough water to equal about 20 times its weight. Additionally, tilling removes the layer that keeps the soil cool and protects it from erosion. Since soil cover shades the soil and holds it together, that protective layer is necessary. Tilling takes away this layer, rendering the soil defensive. 
Since there is no shade for the soil, the sun easily heats the soil surface and causes it to dry out. Also, because there are no roots left, it is not held together. In a nutshell, hilling leads to erosion, which is when the pores in the ground are broken and water cannot soak into the soil quickly enough. Therefore, it creates runoff and takes important nutrients and soil away with the extra water. Then, when all that mud dries up, the topsoil hardens, further closing up the soil and getting the oxygen and water necessary for growth. Hilling destroys our soil and can cause many other struggles with crops in the future. While we destroy soil cover, reduce our crop diversity, and till or ditch, all we're doing is destroying the soil and decreasing the nutrients that we get in our food. A study published in the 2017 issue of Environmental Health Perspective predicted that the protein content is likely to decrease another 6 to 14 percent in potatoes, rice, wheat, and barley by the year 2050. This could cause 18 countries to lose 5 percent of their dietary protein. The long-term effect of destroying our soil cover, reducing our crop diversity, and tilling could cause drastic changes in our lifestyle as the nutrients that we need continue to decrease. To learn more about how our soil affects the nutrients of our food, we first talked about the importance of crop diversity. Then we discussed the soil cover. Finally, we uncovered the effects of tilling. If farmers follow these, prin these three principles, they will ensure that our soil stays healthy and our food is packed with nutrients, along with helping themselves out in the long run. Next up, we got Logan Bradshaw with an extemporaneous title is the Peruvian Democrat, Democrat, <laughs> Democracy. <laughs> Elections, 
According to a December 7, 2023 Nebraska Public Media article, the former president, Pedro Castillo, attempted to dissolve Congress by initiating a coup. This resulted in his impeachment and arrest. Peru also has no freedom of press. According to a December 23, 2023 New Mexico article, an increasing number of female journalists are being attacked in an effort to silence their coverage of the protests and concerns throughout Peru. The president has failed in all aspects and has zero respect for protesters' rights, with excessive use of force and many mass jailings. A January 21, 2023 Reuters article states over 200 people have been jailed in just the city of Lima. Peru cannot be called a democracy, for it is not even close to fitting the definition. Finally, we'll discover other supporting events to illustrate the crumbling state of Peru's democracy. According to the previously cited Human Rights Watch article, the Peruvian president labeled the protests as terrorism when they were mostly peaceful. The president conveniently calls a lot of events terrorism. According to a February 2023 Guardian article, the president labeled almost all protests as terrorism in an attempt to stigmatize protesters. It seems sort of like a get out of jail free card. Speaking of jail, the former president was jailed and abused for corruption and oppression in Lima, and Peru has a long history of corrupt and oppressive leaders. The crumbling democracy has been a long time in the making. Protests now cover over a quarter of the country, and almost all have resulted in brutality. So many people are protesting in different ways. If this is really a democracy, they would already have it. There is no way you can call a country whose leaders try to count themselves a democracy. It simply isn't possible. Peru is struggling, not just with corruption, but with poverty, and a crumbling democracy is just the icing. Peru needs something to change. The question I was presented with today was, is the Peruvian democracy in jeopardy? The answer is undoubtedly yes. The Peruvian democracy is in an almost unfixable situation. First, we looked at one of the major events of the new coup attack, the Julieta massacre. Next, we compared the traits of a democracy to that of the current state of Peru, and finally, we looked at other supporting events to illustrate the crumbling state of Peru's democracy. On January 9th, 2023, 18 protesters and one cop died in Julieta, Peru. This isn't a story of a dying democracy. It is already dead. I thought 
I may have felt. What others consider heat, a chance to breathe. But I was naive, and that familiar darkness once more enveloped me, and left me feeling once again, not but hopeless and despair. I'm feeling so scared, I can't breathe, but I must. Thinking so many thoughts, trying so hard to trust. These fears are irrational, but I can't make them stop. I just wish that they'd leave, that my heart rate would drop. I can't catch my breath, my heart's running a race. Against my emotions, struggling to keep pace. I struggle to breathe, but each sound makes it worse. My world seems so dark, I'm trying to reverse. Away from the triggers, away from the pain. All my muscles are tense. Why can't it be explained? God, I need you. I can't live on my own. You're the only one who knows where my fears are sown. Why do they come? What's the cause of this pain? I want to let go, but I can't just the same. I try to calm down, but my fears just won't quit. I can't find air to breathe. I'm stuck in this pit. Panic, worry, darkness, Close me around me. These are some of the words I could use to describe my anxiety. But nothing I can say can speak of its entirety as I cry internally, thinking that I've lost my sanity. But how can I calm down when the world around me is spinning out of control and I can barely see, breathe? You will get through this. You will get through the sleepless night, all the internal fight. And the days that seem right, when the world hits you with all its might, breathe. You will get through this. I know you think I'm overreacting about the silly little things, but to me, those silly little things seem like the doom the world could bring. Can't you see? A spill glass of milk to you can seem like an earthquake to me. I know it might be hard to understand my anxiety, but I hope today I have given you some clarity. So the next time someone is scared and feels like they can't breathe, shaking and crying, unable to see, don't tell them they're overreacting. Don't call them crazy. Help them realize there is more to life than this misery. And no matter the doubt inside, they will be who they are meant to be. Breathe. I will get through this because I know I am more than my anxiety and one day, I hope to be free of it entirely, but until then, I will keep telling myself quietly, I am stronger than this. I am stronger than my anxiety. I told my mom that I wanted to go to New York after I graduated, but she said no because I have bad anxiety. Now I know that she just means that she won't support the idea, or if I ask, she would say no. And I understand that she's just worried about me, but if I don't go due to anxiety, then all that does is saying that anxiety controls my life, that it controls how I act. Basically, that it that means that it defines me and who I am. It, and even though I have it, it does not define me and who I am as a person. Anxiety is just a part of me. I'm going to New York. The only one who can control that destiny is myself, and I will get there. I don't know how or when, but I will. Let this be a message, a message for anyone who has to deal with anxiety. It's not your life. Anxiety doesn't control you if you don't let it. Anxiety is just a part of you, but that's all it is. It's just a part of you that's sick, but it gets better. And if it can get better for me, then it will for you. fossil fuel supplies are depleting and, and the push to develop more green energy sources is becoming stronger. 
In the development of these methods, two specific types have risen to the top, wind and solar. There is quite a bit of disagreement between the advocates on both sides. So today, we are going to take a look at both method methods to determine which one is better. Through the information presented in this speech, it will become obvious that solar is the right choice. First, let's charge our batteries on how we utilize wind and solar power. Next, we will bring to light the drawbacks of wind power. And finally, we will illuminate why solar power is the right choice. In the fight for cleaner energy, the sun will prevail. First, let's discuss the differences between wind and solar power. Wind has grown quickly since 2000. As stated by the International Renewable Energy Agency, or I read a website called Wind Power, onshore wind capacity grew from 178 megawatts to 699 megawatts in 2020, while offshore wind has grown proportionally more from 3.1 megawatts to 34, in 2010 to 34.4 gigawatts in 2020. Now how does it work? Wind turbines capture the wind with blades. The wind turns these blades, which then turns the generator that produces electricity. Using different gear sizes, we, the generator can turn faster than the blades, generating more electricity. Solar is very different from wind power. There are two different ways in order to produce electricity from solar. Using photovoltaic cells, solar panels capture sunlight energy to generate electricity. The other way is to direct mirrors on one focal point to melt a fluid or other substance, and then the pressurized steam turbine generating electricity. There, this method, an example of this method is located near Tonopah, Nevada. The Crescent Dune Solar Energy Project uses mirrors to melt salt in a receiver. The pressurized steam then moves the turbine that generates electricity. Solar is also one of the fastest growing ways to generate electricity. The Arena website Solar Power states the total installed capacity of solar PV reached 710 gigawatts globally at the end of 2020. About 125 gigawatts of new solar PV was added in 2020, the largest capacity addition of any renewable energy source. The only similarities are that they are renewable and clean, produce clean energy. Now to the disadvantages of wind power. The disadvantage of wind energy is that no matter how great the technology becomes, a wind turbine will never be able to capture more than 59.3% efficiency according to Bess's law. Bess's law states that the wind which passes through the blades of a wind turbine can never be captured to more than 59.3% efficiency because of the physical laws of the particles of air. Another big disadvantage is that the amount of wind flow is unpredictable, and non-consistent wind flow makes a turbine generator not as effective. The placement of wind turbines is also limited to windy environments. To produce enough electricity for a large town or city, lots of land is needed to construct these turbines. The Grand Prairie Wind Farm near O'Neill, Nebraska, produced over 1 million megawatt hours last year, meeting the average 169,035 megawatt hour consumption of Polk County. The Find Energy article by Alex Zadano, published September 24, 2022, shows that Polk County consumed on average 169,000 megawatt hours. There is enough electricity produced for Polk County, except it all goes to Omaha. This causes some of the elect electricity transmitted to be lost due to resistance in the wires over the miles and is not livable. Because wind turbines need to be placed in windy environments and Omaha is not a windy environment, it would be a whole lot more efficient to use solar panels near Omaha and transmit it only a few miles versus several hundred miles. The height of the wind turbines is also, a, also has a lightning hazard and can be potentially dangerous to birds if the Turbines are built in their migratory path. Wind turbine projects are also extremely expensive, whether they be onshore or offshore, especially offshore projects. To add to the cost, wind turbines require a lot of maintenance. Residential wind turbines have the same disadvantages with the addition of constant white noise that could annoy residents, along with the flicker of shadows from revolving blades. The cost to purchase and install wind turbines is high, even though maintenance costs are low, these 
costs will eventually add up as you'll have to repair your engine and often. Between low efficiency and high cost, the price of wind turbines isn't worth the hassle. Now let's take a look at why solar power is superior. First, the sun provides a constant source of energy, and solar panels can work even on a cloudy day. Solar panels can be placed anywhere from open fields to your own rooftops. You can use them to power your well pumps or provide electricity for your entire home. For example, our family has a solar panel on our well for our 40-acre plot of land for our cattle. The well pumps from sunrise to sunset for three pumps and doesn't even stop on cloudy days. The panel can produce 110 to 120 watts and on sunny days can pump 15 gallons a minute with our type of pump. Solar energy has provided more jobs for people. The article All the Advantages of Solar Energy by the EMEL Green Power website states that of all green jobs, solar energy creates the most employment opportunities for developers, builders, installers, and maintenance technicians at the power plants. Solar energy is also versatile, meaning that it can be collected in many ways. We can use either solar panels or use solar energy to create thermal energy by heating fluids. The two types can be combined to make thermodynamic solar power plants, which is what the Crescent Dune Solar Energy Project is. Unlike wind energy, solar panels create very little noise, except for their cooling components, which are not constantly running. And they require minimal maintenance. As previously stated, solar panels can be placed on your home. There are advantages to that too. Your electricity bill can be less, and you can gain returns from going solar, like a low risk investment. Going solar can improve your home's value too. According to the US Department of Energy website, Benefits of Residential Solar Energy, solar panels are viewed as upgrades, like a renovated kitchen or a finished basement. So purchasing a solar energy system will likely increase your home's value. The website also mentions how studies show that lots of people will pay premium for homes with solar units. Homes with solar units can sell for more than regular homes, depending on market factors. Just one hour of noontime summer sun is e equal to the annual U.S. electricity demand. Using solar energy is environmentally friendly, producing greenhouse gases and other pollutants. Now you know more about how solar power is the best option for meeting our huge energy demands. First, we charge the batteries on how we utilize wind and solar. Second, we brought to light the many disadvantages of wind. And finally, we illuminated why solar power is the ideal source of electricity. Wind turbines harness the power of the wind to produce electricity. And solar power is captured to produce electricity by solar panels or by other means. Both are renewable sources of energy and have grown over time. However, wind has many disadvantages that are made up for in the use of solar power, such as more jobs, more reliability, better output, and much more. If we make the big switch to solar, there would be so many benefits that could change everyone's lives and help to meet our energy needs. <laughs> Last, but certainly not least, we have Kaylee Crowdy with a serious prose entitled Amanda. I 
too would be in tears. I think it was me who realized something was wrong at first. Or maybe it was Joe. I'm not sure. I never really asked him. It's funny how the things you want to say the most are never put into words. Amanda is a beautiful little baby, but she begins to grow sick as soon as the age of five months. Amanda's mother is struggling to cope with Amanda's disability, doing whatever she can to help the baby. In this monologue, we see through a mother's eyes how selfishness can potentially ruin one's life, even if it may not be their own. Find out why Amanda's mother is struggling so much pain in Amanda by John Willie Bond. About six weeks after we brought Amanda home, it was a beautiful spring day, so I took Amanda to the park. By then, she hardly cried at all, which I was glad for, but she also hardly slept. Joe was worried and didn't want me to take her out so soon, but I thought maybe the nice weather would help her sleep. We got to the park, and I sat down by this friendly-looking woman and her baby named Sally. Sally was only five months old, and she could already sit up by herself. She had this really nice color to her, all pink and white, and she had these chubby little cheeks. I could tell the woman felt sad for me when she looked at Amanda because her skin was so gray. I don't know why, but I lied. Amanda was nearly two months old at the time, but I told her I was wrong. She was only two weeks old. Sally's mother and I talked for a long time that afternoon. Joe would have been mad if he found out I talked to someone else, but it had been weeks since I talked to any other adult besides Joe, and it felt good. Sally's mom did most of the talking, which I was glad for. Sally's mother told me all the details of Sally's five months on this earth, and even some before then. She even named a pain of childbirth to um, envy a wolf. And for one long evil minute that day, I wondered what would happen if I could be five months and be pregnant again. That night, a man cried like he'd never heard before. I remember thinking it was almost scary how so much noise could come from such a small little being. I watched her little fists rock back and forth, and I tried to hold her, but it seemed like no matter what we did, she just wouldn't be happy. And Amanda started making these funny sounds, sort of like crying, but not quite. It reminded me of a long time ago when I was little, and my dog Peanut got hit by a car. We had to wait for my mom to get home to take her to bed. I wanted to take Amanda to the hospital to a doctor, to someone who could tell us what was wrong. Joe and I had a big fight, and it was then that I understood, though he hadn't said a word, that he knew, and he was just as scared as I. Joe said the police would be looking for both of us, and help me to get out. Joe took Amanda from me then, and tried to walk with her, talk to her, and I tried to do anything else around the apartment so I wouldn't worry so much. I couldn't help but think about Amanda's real mother, the one who could have really shared those stories with Sally's mom about knees and elbows and her pressing around her belly and little baby hiccups in the middle of the night. I thought maybe we were being punished, Joe and I. We should have never taken Amanda. We should have stopped her from acting so. When Amanda finally was quiet, I knew there wasn't anything I could be done. Joe came to me with her, and I took her from him, and I held her to my chest, and she, she was down. It was like a wet towel. Her little tiny breath seemed to take such effort to make, and I realized then that I'd been wrong. I had thought Amanda's mother and all mothers were selfish because they could have more babies, and I never would. What could it possibly mean to lose one baby in the very beginning before you ever got a chance to know it? Amanda was only five days old when Joe brought her home to me. The only gift even God himself hadn't been able to give. And yet I knew, even though I had held Amanda almost every day for five months, that my pain could never equal Amanda's real mother's anguish. It was Joe, or more accurately me, who had been the selfish one. I wanted a child, and all I knew, all I spoke about was how unfair life had been to me. Unable to become pregnant and too poor to even consider adoption, that had seemed the only solution. I knew Amanda would never see the morning, so 
but I beg to be responsible. Maybe they could do something. He said, you would have been a man of God, and all I could do is cry and nod my head, but I just said, I would have to leave her somehow, just stranger, never saying who she was, who I was. I cried in the car on the way to the hospital, and Joe did too. I could tell, even behind his sunglasses. When I got out of the car, he said to me, be careful, and he kissed me. He said, wait right there in the no parking zone. Uh, he would go on the block, but not to worry, he'd be somewhere close by. I wonder how long he waited before he realized that I wasn't coming up to him with him. The man looked at me in misery, and I said, this baby is very sick and she needs a doctor. The nurse looked at Amanda, and, and then at me, and then she took her from me. That was the last time that I ever saw her. My lawyer tried really hard to get to understand what had happened. I, I had no way of knowing that Amanda was allergic to dairy products, that every bottle I gave her was like poison in her system. Mrs. Baby came to court, and she said she knew I loved Amanda, and that I did ask for help about Amanda's condition, and that I would never intentionally harm anyone. So his mom came to court, and my trial took place. She never said a word to me, just sat there and cried. When it was over, the judge sentenced me to eight years. But I might only have to be in here for five. I know to Amanda's mother, my eight years will never be enough. She should be. Every magazine article, every television show with a child in it, every song about a baby reminds me of Amanda and of what I did. And that will be for the rest of my life. I guess now I understand why God didn't let me take it. Thank you, everybody. That concludes the round. Thank you.
please. Colton. This way. We don't. We can walk home. No! What? I cannot. I need to go to the back. Uh, it should be over. I, I have to go first. 